Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons on Patreon voted for Florida to be featured in my Statehood series. If you'd like to vote for which state I will cover next, join the Patreon page for as little as $1 and you can cast your ballot. The current state of Florida contained numerous groups of Native Americans, including the Appalachian, the Calusa, the Timucua, and the more famous Seminoles. The earliest Native Americans, particularly in the Panhandle of Florida, were greatly influenced by the Mississippian culture and was part of a vast trade network, producing artisan goods and large mounds, along with beautiful pottery. Their use of agriculture allowed for their population to greatly increase, which created large towns that became trading partners for Native American groups all over the North American continent. When Europeans, specifically the Spanish, began exploring what is today the continental United States, they first explored Florida. On April 2nd, 1513, Juan Ponce de Leon spotted and landed on the shores of Florida. More Spaniards and even some French sailors explored the coast and began establishing settlements. In 1559, the Spanish attempted to settle what is now Pensacola, but after two years, it was essentially abandoned. The French created Fort Caroline on the Atlantic coast, but the Spanish destroyed it. In 1565, the oldest continuously occupied European settlement St. Augustine was founded. It also housed Spain's Florida government. As the English began setting up colonies to the north of Florida, this put the two nations in conflict, especially when the English colonist populations grew more rapidly than the Spanish. This partially led to King Charles II of Spain to issue a proclamation that all slaves who escaped to Florida would be set free, but they had to convert to Catholicism and serve in the militia. This led to one of the largest slave rebellions known as the Stonewall Rebellion in 1739. Florida would change hands multiple times over the next 50 years. Britain would be given control of Florida after the French and Indian War. The English would divide the territory into East and West Florida. However, after the Revolution, they would give the land back to Spain, who would keep the East and West Florida designation. By this time, Spain did not have the ability to assert control over much of Florida so it continued to be a haven for runaway slaves, but it also acted as a base of operations for Native Americans who continued to attack Americans in Georgia. This created tensions between the two nations, like it did between Britain and Spain. Because the Spanish could assert little control over the colony, a rebellion broke out in West Florida in 1810. Over the next couple of years, both Spain and the United States claimed West Florida. President James Madison believed that West Florida was included in the Louisiana Purchase, so it became a contested area. General Andrew Jackson, fresh off his victory at the Battle of New Orleans, commanded troops in the South. President James Monroe wanted Jackson to eliminate the threat of Native Americans coming from Florida and stop runaway slaves from escaping to Florida. Jackson responded with, let it be signified to me through any channel that the possession of the Floridas will be desirable to the United States and in 60 days it will be accomplished. Believing that the best way to protect the United States was to capture Florida, Jackson captured Pensacola in 1818, executed two British subjects who had aided Native Americans in their attacks, and held control over a large section of Florida. Though horrifying to diplomats and many politicians who wanted to punish Jackson, Congress did not censure the general. By this time, Florida had become a burden to Spain, and the attacks by Jackson convinced them to give up Florida to the United States. That would be done in the adams onese Treaty in 1819. Now, fully within the United States as a territory, the process began for it to become a state. Most of the population of Florida resided either in St. Augustine or Pensacola. The two cities battled over who would become the capital, until it was agreed that it would alternate until a more central location could be determined. As the state moved into the 1830s, big changes in the population size led to heated debates over statehood. In 1830, East and West Florida had about 9,000 inhabitants each, but Middle Florida was growing rapidly with nearly 16,000 inhabitants as cotton and sugarcane took off as cash crops. However, in the 1830s, Indian removal was taking place and the Seminoles of Florida were supposed to be moved across the Mississippi River. The Seminoles resisted and the Second Seminole War took place. Because much of the war happened in East Florida, its growth was painfully slow in that period, growing by only a hundred people between 1830 and 1838. While East Florida stagnated, West Florida had grown to around 15,000 people 
and Middle Florida was at around 22,000. As a consequence to the slow growth and conflict in East Florida, the counties of East Florida could not pay the minimum amount of territorial taxes. The rest of Florida wanted to begin applying for statehood, but East Florida was in a tough situation. If they couldn't afford the territorial taxes, how could they afford taxes as a state? Desperate, they even suggested splitting the territory up so that East Florida could remain a territory for longer until they could get on their feet. Meanwhile, a banking disaster was taking place. When the cotton and land boom in Middle Florida took off, the banks available to them were unable to respond to the demand for credit, hard money, and soft money. Therefore, the governing body of Florida, the Legislative Council, who was controlled by the elite of Middle Florida, called the Nucleus, accommodated the planters in 1833 by agreeing to issue faith bonds backed by the credit of the territorial government through a number of banks. Happy planters borrowed indiscriminately, using as collateral land that was highly overvalued and slaves that often did not exist. Within a few years, the banks had sold almost $4 million worth of bonds. Disaster struck when the Depression of 1837 hit as a result of Andrew Jackson's bank war. 25% deflation occurred and this led to Jacksonian anti-bank contingents forming in East and West Florida. By the next year, a lot of the country was on the mend, including Middle Florida, but East Florida, still in a war zone, was having a hard time recovering. However, the Depression brought East and West Florida closer together politically in an alliance against Middle Florida. In December 1838, the territory of Florida came together for a constitutional convention at St. Joseph. The anti-bank East and West was able to elect an Eastern Floridian as president of the convention, Robert Raymond Reed. To help control the banking practices of Florida, to prevent places like Middle Florida from taking over banking in the new state, the Constitutional Convention created Article 13 of their Constitution, which limited the amount of banks and how they operated. Article 13 forbade the legislature to incorporate anything without a two-thirds majority vote and a three-month public notice, or to pledge the state's faith as a guarantee for bank debts. Banks had to be formed by at least 20 people, a majority of whom had to live in the state. Their non-renewable charters were limited 20 years. Banks were forbidden to engage in any business or investments which might be considered non-banking in nature. They could not issue notes for less than $5, probably to prevent the common practice of bank notes circulating as currency, and any profits in excess of 10% had to be set aside as a safety fund. Stockholders were personally liable for the bank's debts, state inspectors were assigned to the banks, and no bank officer was eligible to be a legislature or governor until a year after he had left the bank. For all practical purposes, officially chartered banking in Florida ended when these regulations went into effect. Although the anti-bank men gained ground involving the restricting of banking practices, the cotton growers and slave owners of Middle Florida pushed for stringent slavery laws. Florida's lawmakers had no power to pass laws for the emancipation of slaves. It had to accept any person defined as a slave in any other state. Florida also gave its General Assembly the power to prevent freedmen from coming into the state. In most southern states, the white non-slaveholding population could secure representation based on the white population, or at the very least seek equal representation within the state government that would keep the slave-owning class from possessing all the power. However, in Florida, the representation for both houses of the legislature would involve the counting of three-fifths of the slave population. In Alabama, for instance, the southern Cotton Belt counties made a very strong bid for the three-fifths rule, but lost the larger contingent of delegates from the faster-growing white counties of northern Alabama. The convention agreed that to ratify the Constitution, it should be put to a popular vote. In May 1839, the people of Florida voted, and by October, President of the convention, Robert Reed, declared that it had been ratified. Although the Constitution had been ratified, the United States Congress had to wait for a free state to come into the Union with it. It would take nearly six years before Iowa was ready to accompany Florida, and on March 3, 1845, Florida became a state.